There's my contact information. So I still have my old 509 cell number from when I was living out in Deer Park. Anyone knows where Deer Park is? Um, I've been all over the state, covered parts of Oregon. I estimate I've been, just recently figured, kind of added up, I estimate I've been inside about 220 different fire stations in Washington State and Oregon. I've seen a lot of stuff. So um, be good, always appreciate it. The, uh, I can't give tax advice or legal advice, but I can certainly talk in investments and 457B plans all day long. And if you're thinking nationwide, like humongous company, right? We do a ton of stuff. All I do is work with public sector employees. Been doing that since 2007. So we're gonna jump right in. What is a 457B? Um, this is your deferred compensation plan. Sort of like a 401k, but for public employers. It was created back in the 1970s, specifically for police and fire, or public safety in general. And I, I don't know for sure, but I'd like to say that I'm sure that the unions were involved somehow. I, I, I caught that little piece that Greg mentioned about all this legislation and stuff. Certainly they were involved, because if you think about retirement ages, um, you know, across the country in the past for public safety, it might have been age 50, might have been like 20 years and you're done, you know, different things like that, right? Depending on where you are in the country. So eligibility here is generally 53 with 20 years in. Um, anyway, so just kind of going around this, the flexibility of your deferred comp, probably one of the most flexible pieces that you have of all these benefits you have, you're able to change and decide how much you want to put in it. Um, I know there's a 3% match, so it's obviously, as, as Jim Mendoza mentioned, like the first commandment, right? Thou shalt not walk away from free money. I don't like to use the word free because certainly it was negotiated for and you know, there was a process to get that. Nothing's free. Um, but you can change how much you're putting in. You've got really high contribution limits, which I'll get into here in a second. Change the investment options. Uh, it's a great buying time right now, right guys? Market's low, super low, good time to put money in. All right, that's about the amount of response I thought I was going to get, right? Yeah. All right. With a group that's close to retirement, that's not really what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, I, you know, I want to preserve, I want to protect, I want to make sure there's dollars are there. I did really well. You know, like a year ago, we were doing great. Now what has happened? So I'll talk about investments here in a second. The flexibility doesn't, doesn't end at, at putting money in. It's flexible on the way out. So you can take money out in any way you like, uh, whether that's going to be a lump sum like the whole thing, or a partial lump sum, or a systematic withdrawal. You can start, stop, change the amounts. All of that is flexible. Um, on the tax flexibility, you do have, the, the old traditional has always been tax deferred money going in, right? And across from this is the access piece. So if your account is entirely tax deferred dollars, and realize that the employer's matching going in will for sure be taxes for dollars. Everybody has at least that component. Then those monies are accessible when you separate from service. There's no 59 and a half rule. If you don't know, if you didn't know this is news to you, then this might be great news, right? Uh, maybe the best thing you heard all day. That you don't have to be 59 and a half to access your your deferred comp account. Just separated from your employer. Okay, so somebody leaves Peterstown Fire at age 40, they separate from this employer, they could take money out of their pre-tax source within their deferred comp and just pay ordinary income tax. No 10% penalty, no 59 and a half rule. Any questions around that specific statement? Yeah, let me just clear up one thing here. So you heard match, 3% match. We don't do that any longer. We all just give 3% of our base pay. And the reason we did that because DRS, the Department of Retirement System, said that 3% wouldn't be pensionable. So we just changed it in all of our contracts and our non-refs as well. They get 3% of their pay, so that makes it pensionable as well, which was an important thing for all of us. So we just don't do them. That's great. Yeah, that's great. And I knew that. I just forgot. The word match just came out of my head naturally. So Jim was saying it earlier on that. He's yeah. Too, so. Yeah. So well. So that's that's rare. That's good, and it's rare. So yeah. that's that's awesome. It's pensionable money, three percent given. And those employer dollars that are put into your account, those count towards your annual limits. By the way, um, going around here, the portability part. So once you separate from service, you can certainly move this account to an IRA, a new employer plan. Or you can also just leave it where it is. And again, I'm speaking with all three providers. 
None of them are gonna kick you out of the plan. You can leave your dollars there. The only thing you have to do is start taking those required minimum distributions at age 72. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a little more detail here in a second. All right. Um, every financial website has a, a tool where you can plug in some of your, you create a goal for retirement. And, and if you, I know Greg earlier mentioned that a common goal is to replace 80% of pre-retirement income, right? Not, not necessarily 100%, but 80%. So you think about like your, your gross pay. You know, if you can visualize a pay stub and there's a, there's a bunch of deductions that come out of your check that won't be there anymore in retirement, right? So there will be a lot of things you're not paying into. So compare your gross pay to your take-home pay. Usually we say your take-home pay, that's what you're used to living on, all right? So if, we, if you're not sure what your goal is, 80%, 85%, somewhere there's a good place to start. Our calculator, we can input the left two system or the PERS or any of the state pension systems. Uh, we're working on updating with the, the new 2.5% multiplier in there as well. Um, so that'll be updated. But the DRS has a, has a calculator as well. My suggestion is to, is to use one, whichever provider you're with, use the DRS one, kind of get an idea of where you stand. You know, run those numbers forward, see if there's a gap or a surplus. All right, so just some, some of the basics about, you know, about the, the plan itself, right? So employers can define who, who's eligible to, to participate. Um, what I mean is like, you know, full-time, part-time, and so on, that kind of thing. Uh, must have includable compensation. So here's what this really means, this middle one, is um, I get this question all the time where someone says, hey, Mike, can I put additional dollars into my deferred comp account? And I say, well, it has to come from payroll deduction. Okay, like, and, and additional dollars could be like they just sold an old boat that they don't need anymore. Or maybe their spouse is self-employed or whatever it, it is, right? They got, you know, they got money in their lap or maybe, maybe they suddenly realize, oh man, I've got like $300,000 in a savings account earning like point something percent. I wish I could put some of that, you know, in my, in my deferred comp. But as much as we'd love to take more money, um, these are the rules. It has to be, it's called includable compensation. Where it gets sticky is sometimes around like leave pay and things like that. So um, just, know, just know that. If you do have a, additional monies out there, then what you can do is increase your deferral amount on a per pay, you know, increase that to whatever the limits are, and then use some of those other dollars to, to pay the bills and so on, kind of spend it down, and then go back to a normal amount that you're deferring. So that's one way around that that you, you can do. All right, um, or a rollover source, right? So, um, so you can roll money in. Even if you've left this job, if you leave this employer, and let's say you go work for someplace else, company X, and they've got a retirement plan. So then you'd leave company X, and you've got this little account with them. You could then roll that money into this account, this plan, even, if, even though you don't work here anymore. So upon separation, you are still um, a participant, even though you're not actively deferring. Um, if you zero out the account, we will close it. And then this very last cent, the very last word on here wouldn't apply. So as long as there's money, and, I, and I, I speak the same for Mission Square or the DCP, it's the same thing. All right, let's talk about limits here for a second. So these are likely to go up next year. We usually know by late October, mid-November what next year's limits are. Um, the limits are based on, like, on a cost of living, right? So inflation and stuff like that. Um, Anyway, current normal limit is 20,500. So there's three sources, three sources of money that are gonna affect that. Your pre-tax contributions, the employer's contributions, and your Roth 457 contributions. All three of those together just can't add up to more than 20,500. Any questions around that? You guys are falling asleep or a star group or I am that good. I don't know. All right. In the year you turn 50, so you don't have to wait until you're 50 years old, but in the year you turn 50, so if your birthday is in December, you can start putting in currently 27,000 for the year, starting in January. All right, so that's your new limit. It's called your 50 plus catch up limit. 
Um, the 41,000, notice 41,000 is double the 20,500. Okay, so if next year's base limit goes up, the special catch up limit will also increase. To, to be able to do 41,000, you have to qualify for that. And if you do that, it doesn't mean you have to put in 41,000. I've had a lot of people ask me that before. Like, they're like, Mike, I can't do that much. Like, well, do you want to do more than, you know, what these other ones you might qualify for? So if the answer is yes, see if you qualify. Two, two components to that. One is age related. Jim Mendoza just barely touched on it. He said something about age 65 or 62 if you receive an unreduced pension. If you are public safety, this plan is on a standard plan document. And so what that says is you can name what's called a normal retirement age, anything between age 40 and 70 and a half, okay? Normal retirement age is what you put down on a piece of paper. Um, my tax lady, Peggy, she told me that that is a calculation, not a promise. Oh, I like that phrase, I like that. So when you're filling out the, the paperwork to do this special catch up, you can name an age as early as 40 as your quote normal retirement age doesn't mean that's when you're going to retire it's for the purposes of that form only and you could do the special catch-up in the years you turn 37 38 and 39 or you can name an age later on let's say you name the age like 55 and then you could use it in the in the years you turn 52 53 and 54 so the three years are always prior to the, the age that you name Okay. So when can you do that? Can you do that currently, or do you have to wait a certain time of year to do that? Be any any time, any time. So all you have to do is list the, the three previous years you're going to retire. So there's two components. The first one is just age related. That's and that's all I just said so far. Just the age related, where you name a normal retirement age. It's pretty wide open, right? Um, the other component is called underutilized deferrals. Okay. And so here's what that means. So let's say in the past there were, um, there were past in the years that you did not put in the maximum amount, right? Like years ago, the limit was 17,000. Let's say in that year, you only put in 10,000. Okay, so you have $7,000 of what's called underutilized deferrals. So we, we run a deferral history for as long as you've been with this employer and see what you have for underutilized deferrals. Okay, so previous employers don't count. It's with Puget Sound RFA. It was Kent RFA, that was just a name change, not a different employer. Okay, so if you have enough in underutilized deferrals, like let's say you have $63,000, $64,000 in underutilized deferrals, then you can spread that out over three years at most and go up to a, a current limit of 41,000. Question: Is uh, is there a, uh, a place we can go to to find that number per month or to say a uh, year like, since we've been here? Uh, what we're lacking as far as the pre k So, um, so the, the so Nationwide and the other two providers we can we can run a deferral history. All right, we'll, we'll be able to get that information. Um, your payroll might be able to help them out as well. The promises I don't know, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, Frank, Sorry. You, if you look at your final earning statement from each year, yeah. you can see how much you put in deferred home. We, can, we, can, we can work that. on okay. that together if you need help. Okay. Nice. Well, um. Yeah. No. Great questions. Uh, so, if you're, if you think, if you look at this one, right, the fifty plus catch up. Okay. I've had it happen where somebody, they want to use this bottom one in the years they turn 47, 48, 49, right? Just kind of being cagey about it. And then knowing that in the year they turn 50, they've got this other limit, maybe it's less. Um, I've also seen people use this as, as just as a final paycheck cash out situation, right? You got a lot of unused uh, vacation time, let's say, um, and your very last paycheck is going to be a really big one. Maybe you just use this last provision for one year only uh, for just that to capture that final paycheck. So there's different different reasons, different situations where it might make sense. Um, I would encourage you to talk to me or your local rep about that, and then what what steps to, to go through. You go over the limit, but I haven't seen the excess. Um, if you go over the limit, then then the uh, providers will send it back. Nobody wants money coming out. 
that have got to go through payroll and so on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any questions around the limits? Yes. So if you're doing the 41,000 and you say you started in June, does that mean you need to do it within 22 for your first year? It is, yeah, it's calendar year. Calendar, okay. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so if you're not 50 years old, realize if you go over $20,500, that's either too much and money has to come back or you have to you know, set yourself up to do the three-year special catch-up, which is a once-in-a-lifetime thing. So if you, if you do it here at Puget Sound RFA, and let's say you, you leave this, if you leave this job and you go work some other agency, and they, and they have none of these providers, you know, that no one's gonna know, it's really between you and the IRS. <laughs> okay? Like a lot of things with the IRS, it's kind of an honor system unless you get audited, right? to make sure that you're following the rules. All right, so when it comes to investments, um, there's usually a, a fund menu. We call it a core menu. Everybody's gonna have target date funds, some index funds, a stable value or a fixed account option. Um, there, and there's gonna be usually, usually a handful of some privately managed funds to choose from as well. So whether you're a, a do-it-yourselfer, you wanna pick your own stuff, you wanna have it actively managed, or you want like a pre-mix, you know, target date or risk-based funds, pretty much everybody has those things. Other options you may run into could be a self-directed brokerage option, um, a default investment option, that's super important, like what if you enroll but you don't choose anything, right? Or what if you start up Roth contributions but you haven't established where those monies are gonna go to, you wanna make sure that investments are, are set up correctly. All right. And then I can, so I can speak for us, for Nationwide, Mission Square, and the DCP, that the fee structure is always the same. So these are all no load funds. And what that means is everything is pay as you go. So fees are gonna be annual asset-based fees. So what that means is that you're not paying like sale, you're not paying like five or 6% up front. Everything is gonna be a, a percentage, a really small percentage, broken down or prorated to a daily amount and so a little tiny bit is calculated every day based on your balance, okay? The downside of that, of course, is the you know, more balance you have and the higher dollars and fees you're gonna pay. The good side of that is that trans there's no transaction charges. If you've got 15 different funds versus three different funds, you're not necessarily like you know, spending more or saving either way. So wherever your money needs to be, that's what we can focus on, right? So that's one of the, one of the upsides of, of no load funds. All fees are also paid by participants. This is part of why when you separate from your employer, how you're always welcome to just leave your money right where it is. Um, if, you, if you came from like a private sector where sometimes employers pick up those costs, then they wanna boot you out, right? When you leave that job, they wanna kick you out of the plan sometimes. Uh, in here, it's always the case in 457s that, that you can just leave your money right where it is. All right, so once you separate from service, um, I already mentioned some of these options. Uh, I know Jim already covered the like purchasing service credits or the left to annuity or even another annuity of sorts from you know, somebody else. So these are all of your options that you have once you separate from service. Okay, again, the only thing you have to do is that at age 72, you do have to begin those required minimum distributions, right? Unless you are still working here. So if you're still working here and you're 72, you can still put money in your account. You don't have to pull those dollars out. But if you have like an old 401k or an IRA, then definitely want to check with your tax advisor. You're probably gonna have to do those RMDs on those accounts. But your active 457 dollars, um, you can still keep putting money into that. But the minute that you separate, you're gonna start taking those required minimum distributions, right? That's the, that's the R and the IRS, right? The revenue, they're gonna get their, their piece. Any questions around RMDs? Is it a specific dollar figure or a percentage of account? Yeah, so, we, so everybody uses what's called the uniform mortality table. 
And so the first year is about 4%. There are these weird ratios, like one over 27.4 or something like that. So about 4% of the balance, what it was on December 31st, the prior year. Yeah. So, and then in a perfect world, <laughs> Your provider, whether it's nationwide, whoever it is, is gonna know that you don't work here anymore, automatically send those RMDs to you if you're the right age. That's always something you'd wanna make a phone call You know, in the year you turn 72 and either say, hey, I wanna double check, I'm gonna get that and how much is it and when am I gonna get it? Or confirm that you're still working here. Are there RMDs on Roth accounts? There are, there are, which is weird. So you have the Roth 457, has an RMD, which is which makes no sense because you, you've already paid the taxes. Like, what does the IRS care? Yeah. So at least for now, the workaround there is um, is you can just roll that money out of the Roth 457 into a Roth IRA, and then not pay the RMDs. If you on your distribution out, and say if you're ready to retire and you do the systematic and say you get X amount of dollars per month. Then obviously, if you set a beneficiary for the balance or whatever is left over, there's not a reduced benefit or anything like that. No, no, whatever the balance is, right. So on the beneficiaries here, you always want to make sure beneficiaries are updated, especially if your family portrait changes. Um, yeah, whatever the balance is, if you were to pass, then you know we there's a process for that as a form and a, a copy of a certified death certificate, and we would set up the account in that person's name. Yeah, more than one beneficiary. Oh yeah, yeah. You can name a primary, which is if you die, and then a contingent, which would be if you and your primary die at the same time, or if the primary predeceases and you didn't name a new one. But you can name more than one primary, more than one contingent, if you like. Yeah. Thank you. All right, any questions around beneficiaries? I like the comment Jim Mendoza made about paying out like old boyfriends or girlfriends because I, I had a conversation a few years ago with a person at, at the nationwide home office that, that deals with all that, right? And they said it's pretty horrible when you have, you know, somebody from 10 years ago, whatever, like the person never updated their beneficiaries. So, but I always think, I just think, remember, imagine receiving that money. You know, like, you're like, wasn't that guy married? I don't, you know, how weird that would be, right? So, not that I'm listed as someone else's beneficiary. I don't know. All right, questions around any of this stuff? We have a uh, four to one account that can be consolidated. You can, for sure. And yeah, we call it a plan to plan transfer or rollover. Yeah, you can put those together into one. Well, I'll do the same, like uh, traditional hire with an IRA, you can combine. Well, you have to cash out your Roth if you want to do like one or the other combined. So we're talking like a 457 from a previous employer yeah. to your current 457? Or vice versa, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can combine those. Can you combine the 401A with 457? Um, so you can do an, an, out, uh, an incoming roller from another source Only and retire. Even so, no, at any time. I mean, it depends on the accessibility of that other account. So like, um, you know, let's let's say you have, I don't know, let's say you, you work two years in another state and there was, you know, a little bit of money in a pension system that you were invested in, right? So it's just there. Then you may have the ability to, it's probably 401A money, probably have the ability to roll that into your current you know, 457 plan here, but there may be like a certain age you gotta wait to be able to do that or, or not. So I'd have to talk to them about that. Yeah. 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 So what the rollover is going to say in the company, you still get a 10 in an hour? No, 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 that's what a rollover is. So, yeah, yeah. Rollover means it's uh, it's 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 the tax free exchange that's going in. It's only taxed when you take a cash distribution. No. Sometimes there's an acknowledgement that they send to the IRS that just says, hey, money left the account, but you can easily show that it went in, the same dollar amount went into your account. Um, and I've seen those acknowledgements come out in like May or June, 
people always panic. Like, I did my taxes. How come I got this now? You know, and it's just that's what it is. It's just an acknowledgement. Yeah. All right. Yes. So some of us were employed by the city of Sea Tech. Okay, we had a 401A program, Social Security Replacement Program. Right. How is that different? Yeah, so that can be moved into your current 457 account. It would be tagged, and it would be put in like a different bucket, even though it's one account, it would say it would say pre-tax rollover, you know? And so um, typically 401A accounts, you have a 59 and a half rule on that. But the good news is that the uh, Defending Public Safety Act of 2015 says that if you're retired and over age 50, you could then take a distribution or cash withdrawal from those and avoid the 10% penalty. That's not tax advice. I'm just, just saying. Anything else? So, Carrie, you have to mark your vacation. But that's part of that right? Right. right. So. But the year before you leave, you brought that to Halloween. Man, I need to update. update that picture. That's old. Um, <laughs> stock right. picture. Great. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.